guys, welcome back. And today we're going to continue on with the Turok series and look at the remaster of Turok 2 Seeds of Evil. Now, I loved this game growing up. Um, it was coming out right before Christmas, and it was one of these games that I just had to have. It was one of the first games that was going to have the expansion pack features. So when I ended up getting it as a kid, I played it nonstop, like weeks on end. No food, no water, just kept playing it. So a lot of nostalgia for this one. So let's take a look at the review. Turok 2's story was expanded upon immensely from the first game. The first game basically gave you a line of text saying, collect keys to open up new worlds. The story was really something you had to look up and wasn't really presented in the game. Turok 2 opens with a 10 minute cutscene laying out the story and what you need to do. Each time you go to a new level, you're presented with another cutscene explaining the importance of that area to the story as well as the objectives that you need to complete. This time you play as a new Turok called Joshua Fireseed. You're summoned by this alien called Adon to stop a new bad guy called the Primogen, who was imprisoned in his ship after attempting to witness the creation of a universe. Okay, I had to look this part up. The Primogen is now getting different races of the Lost Land, this is where Turok was in the first game, to destroy these energy totems that prevent him from powering up his ship. If he succeeds in destroying these totems, it will destroy the universe. There's also another enemy called the Oblivion that's attempting to stop Turok. This character seems to act more of a setup for the next game and isn't really that important to this one. The story is pretty good for the most part and is a step up from the original game. In terms of graphics and presentation, Turok 2 was a huge step up from the first game to the point that it was a little bit too ambitious for the hardware it was going to be played on. One of the first things you'll notice is the improvements to the enemies and how they react. In the first game, enemies had a set amount of death animations. If you killed a guy by shooting him in the leg, you'd possibly get an animation of him holding his neck with blood shooting out. Enemies now react to where you shoot them. They still have their 1-2 to two regular death animations, but they can also die by body parts being blown off. Shoot them in the head close range with a shotgun and expect their head to explode. Hit them with an exploding shell and expect part of their torso to be blown off, revealing their ribcage. It's really cool and seems pretty ahead of its time. A lot of first person shooters today could take notes from Turok's enemies animations. Pretty good stuff. The game's engine got a pretty big upgrade as well. The fog is still there, but this time it was more of a limitation of the Nintendo 64 itself and not the game engine. Play the remaster and the fog is completely gone. You can really see the effort that went into the game. And while the first game's levels were similar with just some slight changes to the sky color, this time the environments vary a little bit more. There's a seaport looking town, a swampland area, a cave level, an insect hive, and a futuristic looking ship. So this may not seem impressive compared to games today, but for the time it was pretty good. If you didn't know this was originally on the Nintendo 64, I think it's possible that you might think it was a port of a PS2 game. I do have to talk a little bit about the music. This is one of the most important aspects of a game to me, yet I never do a good job of talking about it in my reviews. Something to work on. Anyways, the music in Turok 2 is great. The first game's music was good at setting the mood. This soundtrack, though, goes for a more theatrical score. The first level's music gives you this feeling of, okay, Let's begin this journey, the universe needs me, and I love it. Second level has a more traditional Turok sounding with a jungle, tribal feel. Level 3 is almost straight out of like a horror suspense film. Just listen to this part. It kind of reminds me of a Danny Elfman Batman score and maybe the dances of adolescent girls in Stravinsky's Rite of Spring Part 1. Yeah, I know, that's pretty specific, but that was like the first thing I thought of when I heard this level's music. Level 4 is again more drum-heavy parts like Turok 1, but with some orchestral parts that give you this feeling of dread, and probably because the level's dreadful, but we'll touch on that in a second. Level 5 again goes back to Level 3's horror-type music. It kind of reminds me of something that would be in an episode of Are You Afraid of the Dark? That is not a negative statement either. I love Are You Afraid of the Dark. The Oblivion sections have a track that is similar to level 1 and has a feeling of desperation to it. And then the last level is good and again feels thematically tied to the first level. The soundtrack is not something that you're going to be singing in your head or playing in your car, but it definitely contributes to the quality of the game. Turok 2's levels were pretty lengthy and usually took me a couple hours to complete. Some levels to me were significantly better than others. The first level is one of the best and gives you a good sense of the improvements compared to the first game. I really like the enemies in this level. 
the way they react to being hit is just top notch. I would have been happy if they were in every level. Level 2 is more the same. It seemed to be the longest level in terms of mat size. I felt like I was just playing it forever. This is potentially a level that will have you stuck for hours if you miss an objective. Luckily I found them all the first playthrough. Level 2 also has a cool part at the beginning where you ride a triceratops with mounted machine guns and grenade launchers. It's a little bit different from the regular gameplay and only happens in this level and it's pretty fun. It would have been nice to see more stuff like this in other levels. Maybe ride a pterodactyl like in the later games. Can you imagine though the frame rate for that on the 64? There's also an undead crypt section that's cool and different from the rest of the game. The enemies there have almost unavoidable attacks which is kind of annoying but they don't take a lot of health so it's okay in the end. Level 3 is pretty straightforward in terms of level design and it shouldn't be too difficult to complete. It does introduce more difficult enemies and forces you to start using weapon strategy. The enemies with swords can be difficult to kill and the guys with the cranky machine guns need to be taken out quickly. This is the first level that gives you a talisman which gives you access to another part of a different level. It's here that you start to realize the point of the talismans. Pad the game length. Level 4. Oh boy, level 4. Level 4 is the worst level. It's headache inducing. The, the map is separated in sections which is separated by these rooms that have level keys in them. Once you go through the first door with a key, the door closes behind you and that's it, you can't go back. That means when you're forced to backtrack later because of getting the talisman or missing an objective, you have to warp to different sections via the checkpoint portals. I didn't know this and I spent hours trying to find a way to get through this door. I thought and kind of still think the door being indefinitely closed behind you is a bug. If you went through the last portal of Lair of the Blind Ones without completing the objectives and didn't find the checkpoint portals, you could possibly break the game, I think. Also, I praise your skills if you complete all of the objectives the first time through. This level is so confusing. Each part of the level has a tunnel leading to a portal and a drop hole. It kind of reminds me of the first person parts of Jurassic Park for the Super Nintendo. You gotta map out everything. The first objective, in my opinion, is more of a secret area. I just spent hours trying to find it. Just so you don't suffer like I did the first time, the first objective is located where there's a multiple bridges and water below you. You'll know what I'm talking about. I almost didn't finish this review because I could not beat this stupid level. Level 5 was probably the most difficult for me in terms of fighting enemies. The main alien soldiers are bullet sponges unless you headshot them, and the remote turrets will cut you down in seconds. You'll run into a room and realize you're getting shot by something, and by the time you realize it's a turret on the ceiling, you're probably going to die. This is the only level where I died multiple times. The turrets just do so much damage. This level definitely forces you to create a strategy to defeat enemies. There are also many rooms that have floating platforms, so a misstep is an instant death. The level itself though wasn't too difficult, and navigating it, I never found myself really getting lost. One of the objectives that has you destroying an egg layer is somewhat hidden, so you may miss it your first time through. I just got lucky because I was blowing up the area around it. Just be sure to blow up any wall that looks like it's breakable. The final level is probably the shortest and easiest in terms of level design. There's a main hub with four branching paths and a final door to the boss. The enemies are difficult, but they can be dispatched pretty easily if you use the right weapons. This level also has a different version of turrets as well. They are again a pain in the ass. They do however take a lot less damage. They just tend to appear after you walk past them so they're always shooting you in the back. It's bullshit. bullshit. <laughs> Finally there are the bosses. In my review of Turok 1 I said that the strategy for them was basically just strafing in a circle and shooting until their health is depleted. The bosses in Turok 2 have certain body parts that have to be destroyed in order to defeat them so there's a little bit more strategy. I had to run away a few times during the battles to farm health but they're still pretty easy for the most part and were all defeated on my first try. Better overall than the first game's bosses, but still they could be better. I talked about the weapons in the first game, so I definitely need to talk about them in the sequel. The developers really added some cool weapons this time and improved on some of the existing. So let's take a look, shall we? Instead of a knife, you're given a talon this time, and they work really well against the small dinosaurs in the first two levels. I forget their names, I'm gonna put it right below. They're the, they're the ones that are in Jurassic Park 2. The Warblade is an upgraded version of the Talon and has a retractable blade like the Predator. It supposedly works well against smaller enemies, but I didn't find it until the last level, so there was really no use of it for me. I believe it is in level 2, so make sure that you find it. Next you have the regular bow, and same as the last game, you don't really use it because you get upgraded to the deck bow pretty early on, so there's no real use. 
The tech bow and the regular bow now share a new gameplay feature in this game. You can actually pick up and reuse the same arrows. Also, since headshots are fatal, you can take out an enemy with just one well-placed shot. This to me is just fantastic, and it reminds me a lot of the more recent Far Cry games. The tech bow also has a sniper ability, so you can get some pretty far shots. The sniper ability is especially fun in the remaster since they removed all the fog. It would be difficult, but I'm pretty sure you could just use the bow the whole game. The pistol is nothing special again. It's useful in the game though, since you can one-shot enemies with a headshot. The upgraded version of that is the Mag-60, and it shoots a three-round burst, and it can be pretty useful. It does tend though to eat up ammo, so I didn't really use it a lot. The shotgun is back, and it's better than ever. The first time you close range an enemy is just so good. I stopped using it when I got to the later levels due to slow reload, but it was very helpful for a majority of the game. The shredder is basically the new version of the auto shotgun, and it scatters into multiple bullets when it hits a target. I never used it in the beginning levels, I thought the shotgun did a better job. It does become extremely useful though against turrets in the last two levels. The explosive shotgun shells in both guns are generally going to be one of your best friends in the game. They can just clear out a room in a pinch. Some of the weapons in Turok 2 are useless in my opinion, and those are the tranquilizer gun, charge dart gun, sunfire pod, and all of the water weapons. The tranquilizer gun does what you think, but only really works on the weaker enemies. It's a lot easier to kill an enemy with another weapon. The charge dart will freeze an enemy in place allowing you to kill them with an easy headshot. I used it once or twice, but not much more than that. Sunfire pods are basically flashbangs, and I never used them once. With the water weapons, I'm not really sure why they added them. They're really only useful during a small section in level 4, where you had to fight some enemies underwater. It seems like an idea that they just didn't expand upon. The rocket or scorpion launcher and grenade launchers are basically the same as the first game, with exception to splash damage. You no longer have to worry about blowing yourself up, which is really nice. Flamethrower is a nice addition and works well against the smaller annoying enemies. The Firestorm Cannon is the successor to the minigun and uses the same ammo as the plasma rifle. I didn't use it that much due to wanting to conserve ammo for the rifle. The Razor Wind is a saw boomerang like the one from Predator 2, and it's pretty cool. The only problem with this one is that they don't give it to you until the last part of the game, so it's really not useful by that point. Then there's the PFM layer, which is basically a mine launcher, and is very, very good at taking out large groups of enemies at once due to the high damage output. Then we have the most infamous weapon in the game, and that's the Cerebral Bore. It basically sends a heat-seeking drill to the enemy's brain, drills it out, and then finally explodes. Some people say it looks cool, but it's not very useful. I found that I used it a lot in the last two levels with some of the harder enemies. It definitely saved me in some spots in the later levels when I had really low health and had to take out a larger enemy. The plasma rifle is probably tied for the best gun in the game next to the shotgun. The gun now has a sniper scope, which is so important in the later levels. An enemy that would normally drain your ammo can be taken out in one shot to the head with the plasma rifle. And finally we have the nuke. Like the Chrono Scepter, the nuke is not obtainable until the end of the game once you get all the pieces. In the review of the first game I said that the particle accelerator was the coolest looking weapon. Well the nuke is basically a combination of the particle accelerator and the Chrono Scepter. It's really really cool, but again, it's only available for the last boss, so it's, it, I don't know, it kind of loses its coolness there. So the gameplay is a tricky one for me. Ask me if Turok 2 was better than the first one before playing the remastered, and I would have said yeah, definitely. But now I'm not really so sure. The first game had you collecting three keys per level with an optional Chrono Scepter piece. This time you have three keys, a feather, a talisman piece, a piece of the nuke weapon, which is basically the same as the Chrono Scepter, a key piece to the final boss, and then varying objectives to complete such as save four children or deactivate X amount of computers. It's a lot of stuff and can be overwhelming the first playthrough. You need to know going into it that the game requires you to revisit previous levels in order to collect everything. Don't waste your time spending hours trying to complete everything before exiting the level. It's not possible. Also, with exception to the new weapon, all other items are required to beat the game. Well, I thought the regular keys, the final boss keys, and the new pieces, and I guess to an extent the talismans were pretty straightforward to find, the objectives can be headache inducing if you're missing one by the end of a level. The levels are so big and confusing that if you miss an objective, backtracking just becomes a nightmare. The talismans that you collect really have no purpose but to pad the length of the game. Each level has a feather to collect, 
and then that feather can be used to open up specific portals that have a talisman. The talisman gives you specific abilities such as being able to swim in toxic water or see invisible walkways. Each level has a section that requires one of those talismans to proceed, and the end of those sections always gives you a key to the final boss. They set up the talismans in a way that forces you to have to return the levels. For example, the talisman obtained in level 2 is used in level 1 to get the boss key. All of the backtracking for boss keys was just, just absolutely annoying to me. Also, when you play this game, make sure in the beginning that after you beat level 1, go to level 3 first before level 2. The talisman in level 3 is required to complete level 2. I wish the talismans were used in other ways in the levels and not just a way to get the final boss keys. One of the talismans lets you take these giant jumps from marked pads. They could have used that for some type of platforming section. Platforming sections in general actually have been removed, which kind of takes away from the uniqueness that the first game had. Without those crazy jumps that make your palms sweaty, the game feels more like a traditional shooter with some fetch quests. And I'm not saying this is bad, it's just to me it wasn't as fun as the first game. The last thing I want to talk about is the frame rate. With the remaster available now, is there any reason to play the 64 version? No. There is. Unlike the first Turok, going back to Turok 2 on original hardware is just brutal. The game barely runs. No one was talking about frame rates and frame pacing like today, but even back then, as a 12 year old kid, I knew this game had problems. It feels like at its best running at 15 to 20 frames per second with constant dips into the single digits. The draw distance is better than the first game, but it's still terrible. Honestly, the game's difficulty is much higher on the original just because of technical problems. Aiming for headshots is just a chore with the game chugging along. The remaster runs at a smooth 60 frames per second. The gameplay difference is it's just night and day. I would say maybe play the original to see its beginnings, but to really enjoy the game, play the remaster. Overall, Turok 2 is definitely worth picking up. The game is fun and I find it gets better with each playthrough, especially when you know where everything is located. If I had to choose between the first game and the sequel, I would probably choose the first game. There are a lot of improvements to the series in the sequel, and it again is really fun to play, but I just enjoyed the simplicity of the first game. Explore, find keys, kill bad guys. The addition of objectives and the talismans were just a bit too much in my opinion when paired with the massive levels. I would remove the objectives altogether or at least make them a little bit easier to find on some of the levels. Keep the talismans, but give them more of a purpose than to pad the game's length. Maybe one day we'll get a remake that makes improvements to the original design. Probably not, but we'll see. That was my review for Turok 2 Seeds of Evil. Uh, what would you guys think? Do you think the, the first game is better than the second? Uh, I was a little hard on it in the review, but it, it, it is a really good game. I just really like the simplicity of the first game. But let me know what you think in the comments below, and please make sure to like and subscribe. Uh, it really helps me out, and I really appreciate you watching. Have a great day. Yeah, Marty. Oh my gosh, Marty, what happened? Ugh, look at this alley I got when I went to the jungle. Marty, I just let you outside like five minutes ago. Well, it doesn't take long to go to the jungle when you go through the portal into the Lost Lands. You were in the backyard. Dad, I did go to the jungle. Maybe this will help you believe me. Oh, what? Is this the jungle? How did I get here? I have a hat, a pack, and... Oh. Jeez, Marty, that's that's crazy. I, I'm not going to let you out there anymore. They just bit me a little. They didn't mean to bite me. I mean, I'm all fixed up now. Well, you want to play some more turtles? Yeah, yeah, let's play a little more. Okay. <laughs>